Yeah, so good morning from my side. Um, I'm going to use the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes to talk a little bit about Ethereum technology um, in humanitarian aid or more generally blockchain technology in humanitarian aid. As far as I know, maybe someone from the organizers can confirm that we have a bit of a funny setup. I have like 10, 15 minutes here on this stage and then everyone who's interested in whatever, whatever I was, I'm talking about can join me on the other stage and I'm going to do kind of like uh, continue my talk there. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about this using an example of the United Nations World, uh, World Food Program. Um, so I'm not from the United Nations World Food Program. I'm from uh, Parity Technologies. We are a core blockchain technology company. We're 80 or so people mostly in Europe with, with our headquarters in Berlin. Uh, we mostly build kind of like uh, the actual software that underpins uh, blockchain, so kind of like the cryptography and distributed systems and so on um, uh, behind those technologies. Uh, but we sometimes also help teams that actually build on our technology stack, and uh, this is one of those examples. Um, <clears throat> right, so this is a quick overview of stuff we are, um, we're kind of like our, our product line. Uh, uh, at Parity Technologies. So this is all free and open source software. So uh, if you go on GitHub slash Parity Tech, uh, if you want to play around with it or you want to go to get into it on the code level, uh, this is the place to, to check out. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about Parity Ethereum, which is our Ethereum stack, and then a little bit um, in more of an outlook about Polkadot and Substrate. Um, all right, so Parity Ethereum. Um, we have... Uh, uh, when we set out in 2015 with Parity Technologies, the first project we've taken on was to build a implementation of the Ethereum protocol in the programming language Rust. And we've done that, and it was kind of like just the base protocol implementation of Ethereum, which you can use with the Ethereum mainnet. So a lot of the, the people in our team back then uh, were alumni from the Ethereum project, uh, so it was kind of like a, a, you know, a natural first project to take on. What we've realized over the course of uh, 2016, 2017, while it, the Ethereum mainnet was growing and our market share in that, uh, in that network was growing, so uh, now a, you know, a large chunk of the Ethereum public mainnet runs on this, on this technology stack, uh, that people are actually using Ethereum technology for a lot of things that uh, are not directly related to this Ethereum mainnet. So a lot of people spin up Ethereum-based networks, especially a lot of people spin up private Ethereum-based networks. Um, so within their company, organization, or across organizations. Um, but what we found is they actually have different requirements for this technology stack um, that you would need to extend this uh, vanilla Ethereum protocol with to, to cater to those. And I call them enterprise requirements here, though. Uh, in fact, in humanitarian aid, like most of the use cases I've seen actually uh, in one way or another fall under this category. Uh, so we've, what we set out to do over the course of a year or so, we uh, started to build out protocol extension, uh, extensions and abstractions in, in this like core node software that would allow to uh, cater to those requirements. So one is alternative consensus mechanisms. I think that's someone most people are aware of. Uh, you know, if you want to set up a private network, uh, mining is probably not what you want. You actually want to, you know, plug in something else. So we were the first client implementers to abstract over the consensus mechanisms. And basically, um, you know, you can plug in other, other mechanisms to come to consensus um, that do not require uh, mining. The privacy and permissioning is all around the idea that in public blockchains, basically by definition, all data is public and everyone can perform every task. So what you really want, uh, so those are th features you don't really want in most uh, uh, use cases that shouldn't live on a public blockchain. So what you want is some form of fancy cryptography and key distribution to make sure you actually have some form of access control. So only the people who should be allowed to see certain data can actually see certain data. And permissioning is all around the idea that if I download the Parity Ethereum node software today on this computer, I can connect to the, to the public Ethereum mainnet and I can perform every task. I can deploy smart contracts, I can interact with smart contracts, I can do value transfers, I can become a miner. Um, this is really not what you want in those use cases. What you really want is some form of um, you know, fine granularity in like, uh, how you can decide who's actually allowed to do what in your network. Um, alternative VM, this goes a little bit deeper in kind of like the core technology, but uh, Ethereum runs on the Ethereum virtual machine, on the EVM, um, and 
although the Ethereum community is fairly large considering all of the blockchain space, the EVM has no adoption beyond the Ethereum space. Uh, that means all the optimizations, all the tooling, all the developer tooling you would build for this uh, has to come from within the Ethereum community. There are other VM solutions, especially if you talk about WebAssembly. Who, I don't know how many people are familiar with that, but there are other VMs that have much, much greater support uh, from, uh, from developer communities than the EVM. And you actually see this shift, uh, not just within Ethereum, but actually across a lot, a lot of kind of like these next generation platforms to push towards EVM. And we've done that actually already last year. We've, you can not just swap out the consensus, you can even swap out the, the VM in parity Ethereum and can plug in a, a WebAssembly VM with an uh, Ethereum uh, account and transaction scheme. And then you can write suddenly smart contracts, not just in Solidity, but you know, in C++ or Rust or C or anything that compiles onto that. Uh, low hardware requirement, or maybe I should call it like flexible hardware requirements. Every time you have a use case where you want to uh, put a blockchain client on a, a hardware device that is not like a home computer, right? Maybe on a mobile the phone or some embedded uh, device or something like that. Um, that's where you really have to think about how can we do engineering trade-offs or also trust model trade-offs to make clients, the software clients with which you can interact with the blockchain, as light as possible. Um, and so we spend quite, quite a, an amount of time to, uh, to crack that problem. Chain interoperability, I'm going to talk about that uh, a bit more um, in a second, but uh, it's the whole idea that if all these people spin up these Ethereum-based chains or hyperledger-based chains or, or, or what it might be, then uh, you end up in data silos that blockchain kind of promises us to break out of. Uh, so the, the idea is, can we not come up with a protocol that then connects those chains again? Okay, so uh, that was kind of like the technology background. That's the technology stack we're talking about. Um, now, the actual project or background to the project. So it was uh, it is in the context of the conflict in Syria, where um, a uh, large amount of the population in Syria uh, was uh, fleeing to the neighboring countries and uh, Jordan especially. So in Jordan, I think it's like a 5 million uh, population size and roughly 500,000 Syrian refugees at that point. So like 10% of the population uh, is comprised of Syrian refugees. And um, the World Food Program had a big intervention or has a big inter intervention um, they are to help those people. And if people think of the World Food Program, they often think of these kind of pictures. Um, like, the World Food Program comes in and brings food to a region where there's not enough food. Uh, in fact, the, the World Food Program has changed over the last decade or so quite drastically their approach to those things. We're away from these in-kind food assistance towards cash-based transfers. So if there is a somewhat working local economy, what you do instead of bringing food, you bring in cash. Um, so that not just empowers the refugees themselves, but also has ripple effects into the local economy. So um, with that background, uh, in May 2017, uh, while this big intervention was going on, uh, or started to go on, um, and kind of like blockchain started to come into like the, the, the minds of the mainstream, uh, the World Food Program approached us and said, we want to start a pilot in a refugee camp there. And we have this problem, we want to distribute all these funds, we have a problem that we have to go through all these financial intermediaries, or we have to do it in an analog way, so we actually have to give out like local currency or food vouchers or something like that. Highly inefficient, big leakage, a lot of corruption, and so on. Um, so what we did, we um, uh, spun up a parity Ethereum-based blockchain network uh, amongst uh, certain participants in that network. And um, we basically uh, use a lot of the technology that I was just talking about to, uh, uh, you know, to counter those problems. And started out with 10,000 refugees uh, in May 2017, scaled it up during that year to uh, more than 100,000, and uh, approaching now more like, uh, you know, roughly ha half a million. So the goal is to have all of the Syrian refugee population in Jordan on this system, looking into scaling it out to other countries and, and also other UN agencies are joining. So uh, can someone confirm that I'm done with my talk here or can I just keep going? I'm, I'm actually not fully. Two more minutes? Okay, I'll just keep, keep going and then I'll, yeah, awesome. Um, so yeah, so right now we have two UN agencies on the system. That is United Nations World Food Program who kind of initiated that. United Nations Women has uh, just joined the system and we're in talks with, with other organizations. But really the, the big goal is not just to make 
have this one single business logic and have solved this one problem, but rather have a really like an interagency collaboration network where you can, in theory, build tons of different uh, use cases on top. Um, so how it works, at least with this business logic, is uh, kind of like shown in this little diagram. Here on the bottom left, you have the World Food Program. The World Food Program can issue tokens on this network. And since we're talking about programmable money, they can issue tokens with, you know, attached with any form of code or um, uh, permissions or, or, or data attached to it. So they can uh, issue tokens that represent local currency or food or really whatever they want to, to refugees who all have accounts on this network. And they can say stuff like, this expires in a month, or this can only be spent by a certain set of people, maybe a family or something like that, or can only be spent in certain stores or on certain things, and so on. By that, obviously having much more control than just you know, giving out cash and then hoping it's being spent on something that's, that, that actually helps those people. Um, and then those refugees can go into local food stores, um, you, have, you know, you imagine there's like a big iPad or something where, where it says like this is the stuff you have at hand for this month or this week or this day. Um, they can get their stuff, they authenticate themselves and they leave the store. And uh, those tokens get transferred while, uh, if the authentication happens, uh, get transferred to the food stores. And now the only, only point where you actually have cash in the system is when the World Food Program settles with those local vendors. So uh, really you f completely disintermediate um, uh, local financial service providers, um, and you get completely, like more or less fully get cash out of the system. Um, yeah, so this is, I've already talked about, about, uh, about those things uh, partly, but the overall goal was to make cash-based transfers faster, cheaper, and generally more, more secure, um, get the leakage down, get the corruption down, getting uh, in an audit trail. Um, but a, a big requirement was also all the existing processes uh, for World Food Program staff, for beneficiaries, as well as for local food uh, um, uh, vendors, uh, should not change. Uh, meaning, f fully abstract the way that we're dealing with blockchain here to the extent possible. I mean, you still have to change some things, but really it's a backend technology where you can abstract away um, a lot of things. Um, and yeah, and generally, uh, more generally, then the nice thing with those things is we can actually publicly talk about this. So at Parity, we do a lot of those things, but obviously, most of those projects you're not allowed to talk about because it's like with some corporates. Uh, the nice thing with the World Food Program is they're fairly uh, public about those things. So in the second half of this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to do an outlook. So what's on the horizon? What are the technologies that are coming? What are challenges that we are facing? And how can we probably tackle that with technology innovation in the next 12 to 24 months? So if you're interested in that, uh, feel free to join me.